but I believe that this is, you know, a real privilege to hear from these brilliant minds. And don't be afraid and don't be shy to pick their brains, ask questions afterwards, because they are literally laying the foundation of the tech for the future. So um, this is really exciting, and I'm going to get right into it now and introduce the next session, which we're in for a real treat from the LightSpark executive team, which is going to demonstrate and discuss their newly released Chrome wallet, I like this, extensions that enables money to move just like bits and bytes do on the internet. That is cool, seamlessly. So in this session, you'll discover LightSpark's suite of tools that enables you to integrate Lightning payments faster and more easily than ever before. And we all know that that is a major problem in this ecosystem. So I'm so, so excited to hear from them. We've got Kevin and Christian from LightSpark. Come on up. Give them a big round of applause. Good morning. Um, I am Kevin. I'm the CTO at LightSpark, and we are super excited to talk to you today and tell you a little bit about what we've been building and how we are trying to make Lightning simpler for our customers. Okay, so before we get into that, though, let's do a little bit of history. I'll be brief with it. Um, so the people that created the internet as you know it today were originally planning on a payment solution that was an HTTP error code 402, which was meant to mark that um, a resource or page wasn't available without making a payment. Now, unfortunately, this never actually came to be. Um, but at LightSpark, we think that with Bitcoin and Lightning, that's something that we can actually now do. Um, so you can move money as easily as you can move TCP packets on the internet today. Um, and we do that through using Lightning. And one of our colleagues, Taj, was actually one of the co-authors of the original Lightning white paper. And we are working to try to make that vision a reality now and make Lightning super easy to use. Unfortunately, today, it's not so easy. So if we ask everyone's best friend, ChatGPT, what it thinks about using Lightning, um, it'll give us a huge list of things here that are actually very complex for a Lightning integration that's mainstream today. And as we were starting working at LightSpark, we found that to be the case as well. So we tried running Lightning on Raspberry Pis, we tried running it on servers, and it was just immensely complex. It takes a lot of work to actually get up running, and it takes a lot of work to actually do well. Um, and when we talked to other companies, whether they were in the crypto space or not, they also mentioned that it was immensely complex. And there are a lot of challenges that are different than your typical L1 challenges. Um, and so why is it actually so complex? And why have so many companies kind of given up on lightning midway through? Like they would start integrations and decide it was just not worth the effort and it would require full-time people throughout the life cycle where you have to actually manage these nodes. And Part of that reason is just the channel-based payments. They are an unfamiliar concept, even to crypto companies that deal in L1s. Um, who do you open channels to? Do you need to rebalance and how often? How much money do you actually put into each of the channels? Do you need to pay someone for inbound liquidity? All these concepts are just really hard and then actually making your payments successful with low latency is actually not super easy. So at LightSpark, what we are trying to do is make that very simple. Take away all that complexity, abstract away even the concept of channels, and just make it a very simple intuitive interface where you can send and receive money. So let's look a little bit at what we built. So the first thing you'll see here is just our signup flow. So it's just super simple signup flow. You fill out a couple things. We will spin up a node. It takes just a matter of seconds and you will land on our dashboard. So our dashboard, which you'll be seeing here, shows you just some basic information, like your, the amount you've sent and received, the average latency, some graphs showing transactions today versus the prior day. Um, and even in the top right, you'll see you can toggle between test mode and mainnet mode. Um, so you can onboard and start testing right away for free. You don't need to actually put in any information. It's just this quick and you're on board and ready to start sending payments. In the bottom right there, you'll see the four main actions, so deposit, withdraw, send and receive. Um, and you'll notice there's no notion of channels here. 
You don't have to worry about how do I allocate my funds, how do I get inbound liquidity. All that just magically works for you. So let's go through these payment request flow. So you'll see it's just a super simple intuitive interface. You put in the amount you want to request, the memo, and you get a QR code. And you can scan this from any Lightning-enabled wallet, which is really one of the beautiful things about Lightning is that it's an open, interoperable protocol where anyone that has a Lightning-enabled wallet can send and receive. Um, you don't need to be on the LightSpark stack. And you'll see from here, we onboarded, we were able to complete a payment in just a matter of seconds. Now, we don't actually expect most of our partners to spend the bulk of their time on our web interface. We expect that they will integrate over APIs and SDKs. And what we want to do is actually just make that very simple and intuitive for them. So you'll see here, we will do a sample code of our JavaScript sample code, um, where we create an invoice, we decode the invoice, and we actually make a payment. And it's just a few lines of code. There's nothing very complex here. You're able to onboard and start making a payment in your, your own code very simply. And we have a whole bunch of SDKs that wrap our APIs, but we also have the raw GraphQL interface that you could use, which allows you to query as much or as little data as you actually want to, which allows you to customize your app so that you can fetch a lot of data if you want to or as little data as you want to, um, so that if you have Low um, internet bandwidth, for example, for your clients typically, you can fetch very little data or you can fetch a lot. But we actually offer a whole bunch of SDKs which make it very simple to integrate. It's just a few lines of code. Honestly, there's probably three APIs that actually really matter, one to query your account, one to send a payment, one to receive a payment, and it's honestly just a few lines of code. Our last partner integrated in two days we are working to take that timeline down even further. And it's a simple integration where we just try to meet developers where they are. So whether they want custodial, non-custodial, if they want to use different languages, we want to meet them wherever they are. And our developers that worked on this are folks that have integrated to tons of payment providers in the past. We took those learnings and we tried to make this the interface that we would want to integrate to. So we want it to be a very simple flow where you're able to just send and receive payments and you don't have to worry about any of the complexity under the hood. So on this screen you'll see that we also have webhooks so you can set up webhooks for your, your service um, where you can receive real-time updates of things that are happening so that you don't have to do polling. Um, we also have this interface where you can set up different account types for your, the people that are actually managing your nodes. So when we talk to customers, they want the ability to actually have some folks with the ability to send payments, receive payments, some to just view certain data that might be your fintech or ops people. Um, so we have a different set of roles that you can enable for the different people managing your service. And we also want to make sure that if LightSpark were to ever just disappear off the face of the earth, you can recover your funds fully. So you would enter an L1 address, it pushes updates to S3, um, although we're adding more ability in the future to do Google Cloud and others, you can just publish those transactions at any point and it would close all of your channels and push all of your money to an L1 address. Now, we have this simple interface, but we want our customers to be able to build on top of it and build some powerful, magical experiences. And here's an example of something that we built. It's a Chrome extension where we stream money. So imagine a content creator that wants to monetize their content. They have a, a video that's playing and the customers stream a small amount of sats in real time to the creator. So for every few seconds, you get a few sats and you're actually able to monetize your content. And this is something that you really couldn't do easily on, for example, Fiat Rails, where it's going to take days to settle. Here you have instantaneous settlement might cost 15 cents for an ACH to send a penny. Here in Lightning, you're going to have negligible fees, and you're able to do something in real time where creators can actually monetize their content. You can do new things on top of Lightning and open up new experiences that you wouldn't have previously had the ability to do. And we think the ability to do things like this is what really makes our partners more powerful. And we want to enable Lightning for them in an easy way where they can start to build these powerful experiences. 
So now I'll hand it over to Christian, who can talk a little bit about how we did some of this. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about what's happening under the hood at LightSpark. What is great about Lightning is that Lightning is Bitcoin. So if you already trust Bitcoin, if you love the security and safety assumptions of Bitcoin, it's easy to trust Lightning. But that comes with a big catch. You have to solve a set of much harder technical problems. Now, you don't have to worry about a sidechain, additional validators, a sequencer that needs to be decentralized, but you have to deal with hard technical, economic, and market design challenges. As it turns out, Lightning is hard. The first issue is that you're locking liquidity, you're locking precious Bitcoin in pairwise channels. And capital idle sitting there on a channel is expensive. Now, I'm going to use an analogy today to guide you through some of the challenges that we discovered as we started working on Lightning. Uh, and I'm going to use ride sharing. Some of you may remember the early days of Uber and Lyft launching in a new city. So one of the tricks that they always pulled off was that they went after the hard side of the market, the drivers first. They seeded that, they had drivers waiting on the line so that when you would open your app, everything looked like magic. You would get your ride, you would get where you needed to go, boom. Now the problem with Lightning today is that those drivers are sitting there. That precious Bitcoin is waiting for a ride a lot of the time. Sitting there, killing time, refreshing the app, hoping for that one sat you know, to travel through Lightning. And that's simply not gonna work, that's expensive. So if we really want to scale Lightning, we need to get those drivers on the road, trip after trip after trip. And making sure that Bitcoin can move quickly on Lightning is just the tip of the iceberg. We also need to ensure that those drivers have a good map, have good direction. You know, forget GPS, also traffic information. Which road should they take? Where should they go to get you where you need to be? And today, Lightning looks a little bit like this. You have a driver, you get into the car, the driver is taking random turns, left, random right, trying to get you where you need to go. And it gets even worse. Sometimes they don't know if there's a road getting you to where you need to go until they actually try. Or they may try and hit a roadblock. And then they try again, and they try again. You're sitting in that car thinking, hmm, this you know, lightning payment experience is not that fast. And you know what you're gonna do? You'll do what many that approach lightning until now have done in the past. They just give up. They'll take they'll take a walk, right? So they get out of the car, go back to layer one. It's super slow, but it's reliable. But that is about to change. What we're working on is essentially solving all these problems at once. First of all, Bitcoin should move all the time, be deployed efficiently, and velocity of Bitcoin on the network needs to be excellent. The second part is, of course, getting you the best route. We need to put those drivers in charge with a good map and with good traffic conditions. They need to be able to know, I'm about to take a highway, is it like a normal street, is it a dirt road, or is there construction on this highway today? So what I usually use is not a good option, and maybe I need to route again through a side street. Doesn't matter if it's a small neighborhood street, as long as it's reliable and can get you to where you need to go, that's a much better way to deliver fast, efficient, and low latency payments. That's kind of the set of problems we need to solve. Now, what's interesting is that as you're looking through those paths, you quickly realize that this is a problem of placing liquidity, placing that precious Bitcoin where it's needed, only when it is needed. And as you reframe that problem into a prediction problem, now you have a new toolkit to actually address all these issues. As it turns out, AI models, the ones that we've seen in ChatGPT and others, are really breaking new ground in how we can advance problems like the prediction problem of lightning. And as you apply these techniques, you're getting those drivers on the road faster, you're getting them to the right destinations, and you're finally getting the job done of executing fast and efficient payments. Enter LightSpark Predict. LightSpark Predict addresses all the challenges I was describing by using the ride-sharing analogy in three simple steps. I mean, not so simple under the hood, but to the consumer or user experiencing our platform, that's what they will feel. The first step is actually build the right roads. So it turns out that to you know, get the job done on Lightning, first of all, you need to maintain, establish, and keep updating the right connections. So the first job of LightSpark Predict is to maximize your conductivity. Now you may ask me, what is that? Uh, Drucker once said that if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. And as we started thinking about Lightning, we quickly realized that 
a lot was not really well measured. So we started developing our own me measures and tinkering. Eventually, we landed on this concept of conductivity, borrowing from the world of physics. Electrical currents, you know, a material stops them from going through uh, if it has, you know, low conductivity. What we want on lightning, we want lightning nodes and participants that have high conductivity. They can get you where you need to go reliably in, in a speedy manner. As we worked on these measures, we also realized that, you know what? What works for a merchant, what works for you know, a wallet, what works for a large OTC provider, it's going to be fundamentally different. Those conductivity measures need to be customized and tailored for your needs. And guess what? The Lightning ecosystem is very dynamic. So you see adoption on Noster. You see new applications coming to market. The network structure and where people are sending payment keeps updating. And you need to keep up with that. So if you think about you know, the classic example of the ride-sharing apps, they would send those drivers next to a big conference venue like this one or a concert venue before the end of the concert so that the drivers are ready. That's kind of what you need to do. But again, conductivity is just the first step. The second step is giving you that map and good traffic conditions. So Lights Per Predict builds a continuously updating map of where is liquidity on the Lightning Network. Now you'll know if you're about to take a highway, a dirt road, or who knows what. Or if the road that you love taking every day, well, too bad. Today there's too much traffic, so it may look like a highway on paper, but really, as you're starting to send your payment, you're going to be jammed there, and you're going to fail. That map is extremely valuable, because now you can start bringing that latency down and execute payments in real time, which is kind of really the goal here. If liquidity is running low, or if liquidity has become completely unbalanced, things that you know, developers have been struggling with in the past, now that is an opportunity. Turns out you can route traffic in the opposite direction, and actually help that node on the network rebalance their flow. At its core, Lightsware Predict is really trying to achieve liquidity where it's needed and when it is needed. The when is important here, again, because remember, we want those Bitcoins to keep moving. And not moving Bitcoin is a Bitcoin that is not well spent on the network. And you have to maintain the roads. So these connections need constant updating. And problems that people have struggled with for a long time, rebalancing channels, managing liquidity, all sort of complexity that's happening under the hood, it's all gone. Let Predict do the job. We're really excited about the convergence of AI and Lightning. They're really two technologies that are kind of meant for each other. They complement each other. With AI, we can make Lightning really achieve extremely low latency, the kind of low latency that people have experienced traditionally on payment networks, high reliability. When you're paying you know, at, a, at a point of sale, you definitely don't want to try five times. And also capital efficiency, putting Bitcoin to good use. So to summarize, what Predict does, it builds the right roads for you, the ones that really get you where you need to go. It will maintain them, and it will give you the right map and traffic conditions. That makes you know, paying over Lightning a really quick, efficient solution. So again, simple, reliable, intuitive, and of course, secure. Right? This is where Lightning really shines relative to some of the alternative solutions. But how do we know that any of this is working? You may say, OK, it sounds really good in theory, but where are the numbers? right? After all, many of these AI models tend to be a little bit like a black box. So two things. The first one, we obsess about success rates. And every time we see a failure, whether it's because some strange endpoint on the network or strange wallet is not implementing Lightning the way Taj maybe conceived it in the original white paper, we investigate, collect more information, update back the models, and try to solve for that. But the second one, and, and this is kind of my economist at, we obsess about capital efficiency. Getting those Bitcoin moving quickly, efficiently, it's one of our key goals. And we benchmark all of our upgrades to our systems every time against that. Here you're looking at four iterations of Lights Per Predict on our stack against you know, a relative alternative on the Lightning Network. We started out, you know, we were maybe two, three times better, and now we're over 15 times more capital efficient than anything on the market. And by the way, you may say, well, I don't care about capital efficiency. I have a lot of Bitcoin to deploy. As we do this, we can pass those savings to you as you implement our solutions. And that's why pricing is so aggressive at scale. These are the kind of hard technical problems that you need to really solve uh, to make Lightning work. Essentially, the velocity of money on the Bitcoin network is what will make or break the system. It's what will define if Lightning can truly become that open protocol for money and truly compete with every payment network on a global scale. 
So to summarize, first of all, I would love for all of you to take this for a, for a drive, pun intended. Um, we're giving priority access to the participants to Bitcoin Builders and Bitcoin Miami. So save that QR code, stress our system, try to break it. We'd love to find bugs and errors and improve and make it always, always better. But what, what, what do you get from LightSpark today? And there's a lot more to come. And in fact, you know, David will announce a lot more over the next few days. First of all, you get what Kevin was describing, LightSpark Connect, your easy gateway to, to Lightning. You can send and receive payments. You don't need to worry about the complexity. LightSpark takes care of all of that for you. The second big building block is LightSpark Predict, which makes Lightning payments capital efficient, reliable, and low latency. And we keep improving those models so you get the best possible experience. And the third one is one that Kevin also gave you a preview, which is this concept of like, to build on Lightning, it should be easy. So our API and SDK are really designed with developers like you in mind. We want you to start playing, tinkering, design delightful pay payment experiences in no time. Again, Kevin already mentioned it takes less than two days to integrate. I wouldn't be surprised if some people in the audience can get up and running in just a few hours. We're truly excited to get Lightning to the next level. We firmly believe that it is the open protocol for money on the internet. And you know, like many in the audience, we're big fans of Bitcoin. So we really look forward to working with all of you in making that dream a reality. So thank you very much for listening to us. And now we're going to take some questions from the audience. There was an invitation to, um, for developers to build a delightful payment experiences. Uh, could you um, name some like, early pieces of inspiration that you have seen in, um, yeah, in the course of LightSpark adoption? Yeah, I mean, there's so much happening from uh, just basic payments, cross-border, uh, merchants. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity, for example, so around gaming, new models for rewards, uh, how you can really incentivize you know, different types of communities to engage. I don't know if you've been playing with Noster, but to us, that, that kind of describes the future, a world where Bitcoin payments are everywhere, Bitcoin payments are easy, frictionless, and suddenly, you know, Lightning is just the conductive tissue of everything we do on the internet, whether it's unlocking some creator content in the creator economy, rewarding a consumer for certain behaviors. So th there's a lot happening, and I think, you know, and, and Kevin can talk a lot more about what he's doing on the tech side to make that easy. Uh, but I would say that the biggest change is that small, tiny payments that were completely impossible, the concept of streaming money that Kevin was showing you, those are things that are getting a lot of people inspired. But there's a lot that we can also do in more traditional, you know, boring payments that, that I think people are really excited about. And we won't know everything that's going to be built by our customers. I think that's kind of the beauty of opening it up is saying, we can't build everything ourselves. This is for our partners to build on top of, and we will help make it simple for you to build on top of Lightning and build these interesting experiences. And we don't have every idea, and we hope that our partners will really just take it and run with it and build some unique things that they couldn't have built previously. And something important in that um, is also that we're never going to be consumer facing. We're never going to build you know, a consumer wallet. We want to enable you to touch consumers, to touch merchants. We're, we're kind of focused on the lightning rail and making this work, and you are going to create those new experiences. Um, I, I have a question here. OK. Um, so my question is really related about how you actually improve the capital efficiency of the BTC. Uh, is your design really trying to share the locked BTC? or you actually dynamically reallocate, restake the BTC. And if you choose to, the route of uh, uh, reallocate the stake BTC, is the speed fast enough given the main chain is about like 10 minutes per block to do what you want to do? Uh, is that some capital efficiency you can continue to improve? Yeah, so that, that is an excellent question. I think when it comes to lights per predict, it's going to be a combination of all of the above. Uh, there's a really interesting dynamic at play here, which is as the network becomes more dense, as we really bring on uh, major uh, non-custodial and custodial wallets onto the system and other participants, you can really benefit from layer two. So you're right that you know, some of the operations, of course, will always rely back on layer one. Uh, but we've simulated a lot of the dynamics as the system really scales. And there's some really good properties that you get as you get scaling and adoption. I'm sure Kevin can, can say a bit more about the tech. 
Uh, but again, we're pretty optimistic about this being uh, very viable. Yeah, so what Christian described is we have a LightSpark node that our customers connect to, and we ensure that the way that we open channels and how we rebalance and the amounts that we have are such that you can pretty much ensure that the capital efficiency is much higher. And we do analytics based on the graph and understanding of use cases that our customers have experienced and typical payment flows so that we can ensure that the money is where it needs to be at the time that it's needed. Uh, one quick follow-up on this. Uh, have you thought about like a lot of the efficiency improvements through like a Ethereum network where you actually can use the staked BTC to you know, achieve other, pur being used for other purpose? Like you generate some liquid uh, staking BTC that can be used for DeFi to earn high yield, kind of improve the efficiency in a certain way. I just want to understand your thinking on, on that topic. I, I, I'm smiling because I feel like you're a couple of years ahead of, of the audience and many of us. Um, look, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, we're taking it in different steps. So ensuring that we can realize fast, efficient, low latency payments is really step one. I think you're right that you know, a lot of Bitcoin today is sitting idle, whether it's in, in different forms of custody. And so putting it to work on Lightning is potentially a much more viable and interesting model than even some of the staking ones that you see in other networks such as Ethereum. Uh, I think all of that will come. And I think as we improve the security of how this all operates uh, from keys to everything else, I think some of those use cases might be unlocked. Um, how do you guys think about the recent developments in the mempool and transaction costs on the main chain? It's great news. I don't know, Kevin, what do you think? I mean, it, it helps drive adoption of Lightning. Um, it also obviously increases costs in terms of opening channels, closing channels. But I think it's good news because it, it helps drive adoption of Lightning and it helps people see that there's a need to further scale. I think it hopefully we can also work with the Bitcoin core community to work on scaling L1 as well um, and finding ways both to scale L1 and scale L2 better where you can actually open channels in bulk. Yeah, and just to add a little bit on the economic side, if you think about that graph that we were showing about the capital efficiency, as L1 costs increase, that puts tremendous pressure on, on, on the Bitcoin that's on L2. It better be working and be moving all the time and kind of shuffling through the system. Uh, I would say as L1 costs rise, what we're building will be even more important. Uh, do you guys have any plans to work with proof of sale uh, providers? Yes, I mean, we're engaging with a number of ecosystem participants, so we'd love even offline to talk a little bit more about what you have in mind. Um, again, we've seen a lot of interest from, from different applications, and definitely, you know, all the consumer merchants, business use cases are, are some that we want to support. Hi. Uh, so, great talk so far. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I, I think about a lot when I think about how lightning networks work is just sort of failure of channels. And I was wondering if you guys could talk about maybe like what sort of failure rates you see in channels, but also like if I'm trying to integrate with a payment processor or something like that, how should I be thinking about channel failures? So we do a bunch of analytics on existing channels within the Lightning Network to kind of try to understand the overall topology and generally where failures happen um, so that we can not route over channels that are historically not successful or that end up locking funds for an extended period of time. And we try to abstract that all away so that our customers don't have to worry about any of that. So we ensure that your payments are routed over very successful high throughput channels and we analyze to see both on an ongoing basis and historically where those failures have happened so that we can build a good picture to make it easy and successful for payments. Yeah, and often people think of failure as a binary thing, right? Your payment either succeeds or fails. But if you're benchmarking this not against other crypto solutions or scaling solutions, but against traditional payment systems, latency is critical. And so it's not so much will this route work, but is this a fast route? Or is there like one node on the network that maybe has capacity, maybe it's well maintained, but it's extremely slow. So speed is another important component now we think about failure. Yeah, you'll often see HTLCs get stuck on a certain node and it can take 
an hour or two for the payment to clear. And that's obviously a pretty poor experience if you were, for example, sitting at a point of sale and trying to buy a coffee. Um, your coffee's going to get cold in an hour or two, and you're probably not going to be super happy. So we, we try to check both the, the binary portion that Christian mentioned as well as the actual latency that happens on certain nodes. Hi. Um, can you share your thoughts on the uh, compliance? Um, I assume uh, Lightspot is an American company. Uh, do you have to be OFAX compliant if you know, um, it come down to uh, sanction some on the Lightning Network? As some background, I, I'm uh, building a web uh, wallet, but we're based in Asia. So if you use your servers, so that means we actually also need to combine to US uh, regulation. Yeah, so Lightspark, we build software solutions. Uh, but of course, you know, as we're catering to the enterprise, uh, we are also in discussions and developing and, and building uh, with regulated uh, players, whether they're VASP, crypto exchanges, or wallets that have to meet uh, their compliance obligations. So stay tuned for more on all of that. We think it's a really important component in, in expanding the, the pie and bringing traditional participants onto Lightning. Okay, thank you. We had a great time talking with you all, and we're happy to chat after if you would like to as well. Come find us.